Peter. So Peter, it's a real pleasure to have you uh, join us today. Uh, I know you worked uh, hard to prepare um, the talk and I'm looking forward to it. Um, sounds like you're gonna cover a lot of different things. Um, so uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Peter Banditini is one of the pioneers in, in fMRI. Uh, he was, uh, he produced some of the initial papers uh, that really you know, started the field, including uh, just doing uh, time course uh, EPI of human brain function, uh, which was, was one of his first papers in the area. Um, and so Peter has, uh, he's currently the, the chief uh, for the section on functional imaging methods at the NIH. He directs the fMRI core facility. Um, and he has been there for a number of years and has been uh, consistently producing pioneering work and uh, really uh, been someone who's engaged the field and engaged researchers. And so it's it's really always been a pleasure to chat with him and he's always sort of you know asking questions and helping people to improve what they're doing uh and i really appreciate that um he's someone that really shares you know kind of what he knows with everyone else and wants everyone to succeed um so um and the other thing i guess he's been doing uh he's expanding um what's going on at the nih because he's he's recently founded a center for multimodal neuroimaging and also a machine learning data science and sharing team uh, within that group as well. So uh, there's a lot of uh, evolution of the field and a lot of things happening right now. Uh, most notably, he's going to be talking today about some high resolution fMRI. Um, and there's a lot of exciting work happening there trying to kind of push uh, push the uh, the boundaries of fMRI and sort of learn more about uh, about the brain using this technique and, and evolutions of this technique. So, um, you know, I could go on and on, but I think uh, without further ado, I'll just uh, introduce Peter and have him uh, share with us his talk. And Peter, thanks again for joining us. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks, Vince. Thanks, Armin. And thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, uh, it was a lot of fun preparing. And uh, uh, just a few words. I mean, most of this work, uh, I've had amazing postdocs in my group and, and two recent ones, um, Renzo Huber, who, who's now at Maastricht, and Emily Finn, who's at Dartmouth right now, uh, have contributed a lot to this. Uh, I have Yuhui Chai, who's, uh, I have some of his work, and, and Lin Ching Li, who's also in my group, uh, helped develop the, a, another sequence for doing high resolution. So. So just to begin, um, you know, the more I got into uh, looking at very high resolution fMRI, the more uh, I came to appreciation of, of layers and, uh, and and how the brain, the fact is, is that there's an entire other dimension uh, uh, that fMRI people have not been uh, forced to be aware of uh, in the brain, and that is uh, layer fMRI. And in fact, you know, everything, it seems like the more I think about layers, the more I see layers everywhere. Uh, this is just an example, looking at this image at the on my front slide, um, you know, uh, just recently a, a massive tree fell down in their yard and uh, we cut it down, we counted, you know, all these layers, each one represents a year uh, it, and it was over a hundred years old, but um, you know, there's layers everywhere and layers are uh, an extremely important part of uh, uh, of how the brain is organized obviously and oh i have to put my pointer in there there we go <laughs> okay so i'm um, first before i get into that i just want to talk a little bit about 7t just because people are considering getting 7t scanners and and some of them might have them i mean there's clear advantages and challenges and the the advantage of course is the high resolution uh, the high signal to noise that you get with 7t um, uh, for especially, and I'll talk a little bit, I'll drill down into this a little bit, is that at below one millimeter, this makes really all the difference in terms of signal to noise. Um, uh, it also, of course, has higher susceptibility contrast, which really helps in your, uh, not only functional imaging, but also structural imaging. It brings out contrast. Uh, of course, there's challenges. Uh, uh, there's higher SAR levels, RF heating is an issue, RF inhomogeneity, it becomes a little bit more of an issue. Uh, be not homo in homogeneity, the, the, uh, the field homogeneity, shorter T2 and T2 star, and also longer T1, which which makes you wait around maybe a little bit longer to, to acquire uh, T1 contrast. But um, those are those are ongoing challenges. Um, and uh, just to give a quick overview, Renzo does all kinds of cool things. And one of the things he does is keep track of where all the 70 scanners are in the world with this updated uh, 
Google map that you could log on to to take a look at. And you can see it's propagating pretty much. There's 82 uh, uh, human 70 scanners worldwide. And uh, if you zone in on, on Germany, you see that, uh, or Germany and Europe as well, in the UK, uh, they're propagating all over the place. Uh, Japan, Korea, China, uh, all over the place there in the U US as well. East Coast, West Coast, and even along the Midwest as well. So, so they're they're starting to propagate. And just to look at the uh, the types of scans being done on our scanners, uh, this is R seventy at our core facility. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, of the sixty papers that I just looked at, most of them, believe it or not, were not fMRI. Most were structural applications. Uh, you know, a few spectroscopy, a few just methods development stuff. About twenty percent is just fMRI. And I just wanted to show before I really get into the functional MRI stuff, I want to show that, you know, the way that 7T is actually going to propagate and the way that maybe centers can justify buying them is for the, the killer clinical applications. And this is just one quick example from Danny Reichs, uh, who's at the NIH, Danny Reich, who just highlighting the fact that, you know, the images are spectacular, but they're also, you can do things uh, with these images uh, that you can't do at three Tesla. And that is differentiate, you know, you can see MS lesions, but not only see MS lesions, but you can differentiate them from things that look like MS lesions. Uh, and uh, at a near 100% accuracy, so 100% specificity, uh, and this is just obviously a limited study, but still, uh, uh, this is something, this is a clinical application of seven Tesla, of structural imaging that can't be done at three Tesla. So helps to, in terms of justifying uh, getting seven Teslas. And this is why there's a growing clinical market, the market because of this. Anyway, but we really want to talk about functional MRI. So uh, like I said, most people doing fMRI never had to think about layers. Um, uh, it's just pretty much we're, we're doing a form of just looking where and when in the brain something is happening. But if you go to higher and higher resolution, you can see not only does the activation become more punctate, but it becomes more defined. And you can see that at one millimeter, you start seeing some definition. This is a motor cortex finger tapping. 0.75, you see some clear, it's all in gray matter. And you see see clear lines of uh, where, where there might be some layer definition. And, well, my phone just started talking to me. Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, so then you see that. And, uh, um, and so because of that, because of that resolution, uh, the field is, has exploded. What, another thing that Renzo has done is, is keep track of all the layer papers, uh, layer fMRI papers that have been produced. And already there's over 100. This is a, uh, was made about a year ago. I mean, it's all updated on that website. But um, And just in the past you know, few years, it's exploded in terms of the number of papers being produced at extremely high resolution. So this is a really valuable resource for anyone who wants to look up layer fMRI papers. Um, but but why is layer fMRI uh, really important? It's not just that you're getting more accuracy. Uh, it's really that uh, it's it's a bridge to, and this is a, it's a keystone in some sense to a bridge between everything that we have been doing over here. This is you know, fMRI, looking at brain areas, and, and, and you can actually, you know, obviously we've been doing a lot of things with this, but it's hard to uh, to really understand the circuitry at this level. Uh, you can understand macroscopic circuitry, and this can tell us something, And but, but the deeper you go, the more rich the information becomes. Uh, and of course, at this level, the information is extremely uh, rich and detailed and important. Um, but it's it's also extremely spatially limited. So so right here is the sweet spot where you can get the whole brain, but also get at start to get at some of the circuitry uh, that goes on. And and this is just another way of putting that same chart. So basically, a, a graph of coverage versus resolution. And of course, the resolution, all these areas that things that are more invasive. Uh, uh, really don't cover the whole brain. And then here's the coverage. And so the, the looking at layers and columns with fMRI is both coverage and resolution. And uh, this is just a schematic, but the basic idea, and, and this is why it's important as well. I mean, this, this is sort of fundamental to neuroscience for, for many years now is that the cortex is divided into layers. 
and I'm not going to go into all the details and it varies from area to area, but in, in general, you can think of specific parts and this happens to be motor cortex is, you know, cortical input is in upper layers, cortical output uh, is in lower layers and getting this information uh, tells you a lot about how one area acts on another and how it receives feedback from another area that you couldn't derive otherwise or it's much, much more difficult or and much less certain. Uh, the problem is, is that, and this is just one example, this is a classic paper by Feldman and Van Essen showing that um, uh, it's complicated though. It's, you know, there's there are many flavors of how uh, uh, cortical layers interact with other uh, cortical layers, depending on whether it's a visual area, motor area, sensory area, whatever. So, the, the story is still complicated, but at least we're getting a handle on measuring it with fMRI. And uh, so from here, you can draw, start to potentially draw arrows of, you know, feed forward and feedback uh, information that then can give you more detailed network models that can then maybe start to derive principles of, of brain function as opposed to describing it. So what's needed for more layer specific fMRI? So you need small voxels. Uh, typical cortical layers are about, you know, two to four millimeters thick. So, so you need voxels that, that captures that. We still don't have enough high resolution to capture all the layers with high definition, but, um, nevertheless, we can, we can get down to 0.75, uh, millimeters, which is sort of ideal. It, it, it captures most everything for the most part, uh, uh, not most everything, but it captures enough to at least start to draw inferences about upper, middle, or lower. Um, and this is achieved with multidimensional acceleration as well as parallel imaging. High sensitivity, uh, a critical high sensitivity is about 40 to 1. Um, and this is after averaging, typically working with time series of about 20 to 1. So 20 is kind of, the, in my opinion, about the magic number that you absolutely need. Anything lower than that, it's just you, you, it's, you have to average forever. Um, uh, just higher than that is just good enough. Uh, and this is achieved with local RF coils and high, high coil arrays at high field. High specificity. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. Spin echo is great, but um, it suffers a little bit, even at seven tester from intravascular signal. And of course, the T2 star waiting around the edges of the readout window. Um, uh, arterial spin labeling is good, but the sensitivity is very low. Uh, it's generally not used uh, for layer fMRI. Vaso seems best. It's a blood volume based technique, but suffers from some low speed and narrow coverage. But I'll talk a little bit about ways of improving that, of how uh, we've improved that. And we also need the right paradigm. I mean, we're, we're trying to come up with paradigms that modulate feed forward and feedback input. So I just wanted to bring everyone back to this plot, which is actually a, a, a critically important plot in, in doing layer fMRI. So this is uh, from an old paper by Kevin Murphy. And it describes what we've all know that, you know, that the at, at a certain resolution, the signal noise is high enough such that physiologic noise dominates. This is TSNR versus image SNR. And physiologic noise dominates and the things start to plateau out. And uh, and like I said, this is a this is the critical signal to noise. But if you start getting um, at seven Tesla at one millimeter, you have a signal to noise of about 40. And if you just basing the signal to noise on the on the voxel volume then at 0.8 you get 20 which is in the sort of danger zone and 0.7 it's below so that's at seven tesla three tesla you can go to one millimeter barely but anything higher resolution you're, you're really really struggling so so this is sort of just to illustrate that we're in this thermal noise domain so physiologic noise isn't a big issue um, but it's still signal to noise we're struggling for everything we can get that's why we need seven tests on. So to, just to put more of a uh, of a uh, of a uh, explanation point on that, this is just an example of TSNR versus how many how long you have to average to get a significant signal change. Uh, and this is uh, a very relaxed p-value and a little bit higher p-value. Uh, and this is di two different effect sizes of five percent or one percent. And it pretty much comes out that if you have a if you're looking for a five percent signal change. You have to average for 17 minutes or five minutes, uh, depending on which p value you want with a TR of three seconds. So that's a lot for uh, for one uh, time series to get an effect. So that's what we're struggling against here. And that's why it's so hard. 
So once again, this is Renzo. He's active on Twitter and he's extremely responsive. He's just completely uh, dynamically pushing the field right now. Uh, there's other people involved too. And as I mentioned, uh, there's uh, all the people that have been uh, directly or indirectly involved in this at the NIH, but we've also collaborated with um, uh, people at Yale, people at, at Leipzig, uh, Maastricht, the AFNI group, uh, Glasgow, and uh, uh, NIMH as well, and other groups as well, Eli Merriam and, and Z. Roth. So this is our pretty much our, our bread and butter sequence that we've used for almost all these studies. Uh, and it's, it's like I said, it's called VASO, and it's called vascular space occupancy. And that involves basically a global inversion pulse. And you rely on the fact that blood is a different T1 than gray matter. So you wait a, a, a TI, a time, until the relaxation of the blood reaches a null point, and then you excite again. And then, and then you, uh, this is your, your vaso image then, which, which, is, which has nulled the blood. And, uh, and essentially, we get two images for the price of one. We get a, we get a bold contrast image, and a blood volume uh, uh, based image. And so if you have an increase in blood volume with activation, you have a signal void and the signal goes down. In all the slides, I'll show the signal going up. I'll just, I just inverted it. Basically the signal goes, goes down with activation. But we do one extra thing. And then, so the idea here is that the vaso is a little bit more, I actually was surprised with this. I didn't expect this. The vaso, turns out blood volume changes are much more localized to microvessels and capillaries uh, than bold, which is, peel vessels, everything. So I, I wasn't expecting that, uh, but that's the case. And we do one additional manipulation with this simultaneous acquisition. So we collect them all, we do our motion correction and concatenation. Um, we have a not nulled bold and a vaso, uh, not uh, uh, a nulled vaso, but, but it's contaminated by bold. We have to divide these two time series to get rid of the bold effect completely. And then we, then we do the analysis. Um, and there's other, you know, you have to divide up the layers very, very well too. Okay, so this is all the stuff I'm going to whip through, and I'm going to talk about uh, as quickly and clearly as possible. Um, so we talk a little bit about sensory motor mapping. We do. I, I, I touch on cognitive uh, applications, su stuff in the visual system, and then audio-visual uh, mapping. All right. So starting out with vascular sensitivities. So. Uh, uh, this is just a quick review that uh, of the various contrast mechanisms, vaso, bold T2 SAR, bold T2, which is spin echo, and arterial spin labeling. And vaso is essentially the small arteries and capillaries, bold T2 star is all blood, T2 is capillaries, and that the T2, it's small compartments, so that also counts red blood cells in large vessels, except at higher field strength where the intravascular signal is lower, and arterial spin labeling. And this is our classic plot that shows uh, contrast versus compartment size. And uh, you can see that um, with spin echo, it peaks around here, but a gradient echo keeps. You, you can do diffusion weighting or velocity nulling of bold to get rid of the intravascular signal. This also happens naturally at high field. You give up a lot of signal, but you, you then only get the extravascular effect. Okay, and this is uh, sort of a summary plot. I'm not going to go into the pulse, pulse sequences, but I just want to give you a sense of sensitivity versus specificity of the sequences. So you have bold, which is by far the most sensitive, and you have diffusion weighted with a, with a pure T2 contrast, which is the least sensitive but the most specific. But if you look at the plot of the of the activation image using that pulse sequence, there's nothing left, and so it's 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 way too noisy. And ASL is a little bit above that. And then what we find though, is that vaso seems to jump out of this curve a little bit. It, it works pretty well. Uh, David Feinberg in the Minnesota group has also pushed uh, 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 Grace, um, uh, which seems to work pretty well. And, and I'm still not completely sure why. It's, a, it's, a, it's more of a pure spin echo. Um, and uh, there must be something about the uh, the timing such that it it's 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 more sensitive, it's more specific uh, and more sensitive than expected from a pure spin echo. So um, so that's that's a quick summary of that. Vaso is great. Uh, there's other there's other a technique that I'll talk briefly about at the end called vapor, 
that combines ASL and uh, Vaso, which helps boost the, the sensitivity a little bit more with Vaso and it improves some of the coverage. All right. I just want to mention that uh, there's a lot of ways that you could potentially still use bold if you calibrate appropriately. I just want to quickly touch on this, which was a nice uh, conceptual piece uh, that Renzo did that we never published. And that was um, just simply uh, collecting the simultaneous bold and vaso and simply looking at the ratio of the bold to vaso signal changes. And so he first extracted bold signal uh, uh, components using ICA. And he found that there are certain ICA components that looked beautiful in gray matter, and they had a ratio of close to one, uh, the bold to vaso ratio. But, and then other ICA components that were clearly in large vessels uh, right here uh, uh, showed um, uh, a, a much, much larger ratio. So bold effects were much larger than the vaso effects uh, right here. So, so you can pretty much uh, map out, uh, you know, where all the big vessels are pretty easily um, by looking at, if you give like, say, even looking at either resting state or looking at a global or giving a global stress, you can map out um, uh, like CO2 changes, you can map out easily where the large vessels are. And even with tasks, um, these are two bold ICA components with finger tapping. One is uh, here. Uh, uh, this is vaso finger tapping. This is the, the bold ICA one, bold ICA two. So I'm sorry. This is bold tapping, vaso finger tapping, and this is the ICA components of bold. And one is clearly in the in a vessel. And looking at the the ratio of that, it's extreme. It's 1.4. So the bold ratio, bold to vaso ratio is high. Here, if you have another bold ICA component that looks like it's nicely in layers, uh, the ratio is, is one. So, uh, and then you could then could use this as a mask potentially for looking at bold contrast, for instance. I mean, there's there's ways of going about this, but it's there's calibration techniques that are on the horizon. All right, this tech, this is one, this is our first application work. And uh, maybe many of you have seen this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. This is uh, what, what Renzo did first. He did a, a finger tapping task in which he uh, modulated, uh, looking at once again this sort of cartoon of oops, uh, cartoon of CSF to white matter along the the, the cortical layer uh, in M1. That cortex and thalamus input uh, are in the upper layers, and spinal output and thalamic output are in, the, in lower layers. And it turns out that when you tap your fingers, you get uh, robust upper layer and lower layer activation. Uh, when you move your fingers, but reduce the uh, sensory input from the cortex uh, into M1, you get less uh, upper layer activation and a little bit less lower layer activation. It turns out when you uh, have no input, you're just giving sensory stimulation then you have uh, a little bit of input here, but nothing, nothing here. Um, and then ipsilateral act, uh, tapping, it actually causes a suppression of activation uh, right here with the input. Okay, and this happens to be just the M1 organization. When we go to bold, when we have this simultaneous collected bold, it, it shows some stuff and there's still able, abil it, some ability to discern this, but it's nowhere near as clear as with, with uh, Vaso. All right, sensimotor connectivity. So we took this one step further and thought, okay, let's just look at resting state and let's take seed voxels uh, in different layer levels. So once again, looking at this diagram, uh, just taking a seed voxel in the upper layers uh, that receives cortical and thalamic input. And what you find is that the seed in the superficial layer shows predominantly uh, uh, more uh, correlation with uh, more uh, posterior regions here, uh, the sensor areas, which which makes sense. Uh, when you take a seed voxel, shift it just a little bit uh, deeper, where you have the spinal output and thalamic output, uh, the correlations actually interestingly uh, also look like they're also going to cortex as well. But this is uh, premotor area, so very different connectivity profile 
depending how you shift uh, your seed voxel, looking at the layers. Um, and we, we even shifted that around uh, the other way then and took seed voxels in large swaths of area. So a premotor seed and an S1 seed. So the premotor seed uh, we found um, right here that uh, looking then at the layer profile of M1, it showed uh, this sort of double hump that you'll see over and over again. Uh, if you look at uh, an S1 seed, it, you see this beautiful peak uh, at the input the, the, where the, the cortical input occurs right here in resting state. So we can take it both ways, either take a big seed in the area that you're interested in or take the seed in layer and see what other cortical areas it's most correlated with. Um, this is sort of a little bit of a twist on, on resting state uh, and also layer fMRI. Uh, it's sort of an iterative ICA approach, and there's probably much better ways mathematically of doing this, but conceptually it's pretty straightforward. So we just took, uh, measured ICA with our, with our data and uh, found all these components. Then we found one component of interest. And we decided then with that time series, with that ICA component in the time series, we did another ICA. And with these subcomponents, with that ICA, we found these other areas. And then we found an area of interest uh, right here. We did ICA again, and we found two more uh, uh, components. And then we even did it again. And this is all with VASO data. Uh, we did ICA again, and then found this, this nice division uh, along uh, individual columns that look like they represent digits. And I don't have this slide, but they line up pretty nicely with the digit uh, 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 locations. So, so a combination of you know doing focused iterative ICA component analysis seems like it, it's nice for honing down. And it's also suggestive of the fact that there's a lot of information uh, in this time series that we're missing by just stopping at just doing ICAs and looking at gross areas, you can keep on going down. And if you're focused enough and you know what you're looking for, you can, you know, without fooling yourself, hopefully uh, you can see interesting things. All right. Um, so, so now uh, Renzo sort of shifted gears a little bit, and this is my one non-layer result that I want to show, but it, because it is pretty, it's intriguing. Uh, this is a, just a simple study. People have done this before, but never at 0.7. Five uh, uh, or point seven resolution and and uh, with with vaso, and this was a task. It was very simple, just simple uh, finger tapping task, uh, one one digit at a time. And for reasons I'll get into in a second, there was another task. It was a macroscopic task of either squeezing a ball or pulling against a rubber band. So it's a it's a squeezing or a flexion with all fingers. All right, so. What we found is uh, something kind of intriguing. One that one thing we found is that Bold was able to nicely separate sensory uh, cortex in terms of the digits, but the motor cortex seemed a little bit messy. Vaso separated quite nicely, um, pinky finger up to index finger. But then what we found is that there was this mirror image in motor cortex that went index finger down to pinky finger, and. Uh, this was re repeatable. So you have only one uh, homunculus or, you know, finger representation in sensory, but this mirror image in the motor cortex. And we just decided to do this squeezing expansion task. And we found that, interestingly, that uh, the areas that were modulated more by extension than flexion uh, actually occurred in a very specific area that overlapped with one of the finger representations. And the other area that did not show this sensitivity that was more sensitive to, to, to both uh, showed uh, overlapped with the other. And this was very repeatable. So you have, you know, we outlined the mirror image representation and this differentiation between this task, and we see this nice lining up. And this is across four participants. Uh, once again, you have this mirror image. Sometimes you even see another mirror. Uh, he even found another one here. We have no idea what that could mean. Um, uh, but uh, 
uh, it's so it lines up pretty nicely also with this macroscopic task here. So in other words, it's saying that that for motor cortex, there's a different set of digits for expanding, a different sense of, of cortical representations for expanding your fingers versus contracting your fingers. And that seemed to be mirror images of each other. And to the best of our knowledge, this is at least a new finding, at least with fMRI. So, okay, um, this this was done uh, uh, by a uh, uh, Dr. Yu, who's a uh, uh, Yu Yu, who is a uh, visiting fellow in my group from from Japan, and he was very interested in sensory cortex. And sensory cortex is organized a little bit different. Um, he was specifically interested in prediction. So one of the things that people who are experts in layer fMRI or layer assessment immediately think of is like, oh, this is where you know you get top-down input that involves making simulations of the world and using them to guide sensory input or having sensory input update those. So this all happens at the layer level. So so he has he's looking at sensory cortex and the way that area three B uh, which which essentially has all the all the digits on it is organized, and this happens to be one digit right here. Is uh, this is three B right here, and then basically that middle layers receive thalamic input, and uh, uh, the input uh, from cortex is from the upper and lower layers. And what he did was he first mapped out the digits. This is uh, D one to D four uh, in area three B. And and the idea here is that you know, and this is with just a stroking, uh, a sandpaper sort of stroking of each digit. And the idea is that it goes through the thalamus and it terminates on layer four. Map these out, and this is a proof of concept. He was looking at uh, either looking at the D one region of interest when he was uh, uh, stroking each finger separately, and only uh, the D one area uh, showed activation. And this nicely is it right in layer four of where we expect. And all the other fingers showed nothing. And, and this is when looking at D3, stroking D3, close, close to layer four. It's a little bit off, but it's close enough for now. And so this was the interesting part of the study in which um, uh, they, they modulated uh, uh, expectation. So if you have a sequence, if you're giving stimulation with one, two, three, four, you know what's coming next. And so you're building up a model of the world of what's coming next. If you're doing it randomly, you don't have a model. And you're not even, you know, the idea is that you're not even really trying to make a model. You might be trying, but it's not, you don't really know uh, what's coming next. And it turns out that that modulates the upper and lower layers. So cortical input, when you have all four fingers involved, and you are uh, doing a sequential stroking, and it, this is looking specifically uh, at the index finger area. And uh, so you see all, all layers activated by this task. But if you stroke all the fingers randomly, you have only the middle layer activated, which is expected since that's the thalamic input, but you have no upper, no lower layer activated. If you stroke all the fingers without stroking the last finger in a sequential way. Uh, it turns out you have some model building in some sense. You have you have upper superficial layer, but no uh, middle layer activation right here. And it turns out if you don't stroke it at all and are random, you have no activation whatsoever in, in the index finger area. So, so this is sort of a beautiful result that kind of suggests that what we expect happen is, is happening is that the uh, that you're building sort of a sense of the world of what you to expect in the upper and lower layers, and and the middle layer gives the stimulus and that updates that. Okay, uh, we try to take it a little bit further, and it turns out that looking at the finger that was left out, D1, um, once again, this is sort of a summary, and we didn't really take it further. This is just a summary of what I just showed, uh, which I think actually shows up nicer in this regard, but this is just showing all the data. Um, showing the clear modulation uh, with a predictable manner, uh, with the random order, and then leaving the finger out altogether. You only have the the more of the activation in the wings uh, of, of uh, upper and lower layers. And then if you don't stroke the finger at all and it's random, there's not much activation at all. 
And if you look at a finger that was part of that sequence the whole time, it's modulated a little bit, but not too much. All right, now we're gonna switch gears again and uh, look at working memory uh, and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So this is some work by Emily Finn, as I mentioned, and in collaboration with Renzo Huber. And basically looking at, uh, you know, if you look at Neurosynth, you have you know 900 plus studies of working memory, and these are the areas that are typically activated, and and you know we know that, and but we don't know much more in that regard. And there's uh, models that are being built in terms of you know what it's we suspect is going on that maybe the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is helping to maintain uh, this sort of cortical network that is keeping uh, uh, the information in working memory. But we don't know that for sure. And the hypothesis is this. So that, well, first of all, the task is, was simply looking at a sequence of letters and either asking the subject to alphabetize them, which is a manipulation task, which is harder, uh, or remember them. And then there's a delay period. And then they have to either respond uh, to the question or not respond. So either they do a motor response or not. And that's also random uh, relative. Shared by everyone. For instance, you may have great. Oop. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, so the idea here is that you have uh, in the upper layers, the suspicion is that you have recurring connections, and this is where the memory maintenance, this is where it's communicating with the, uh, the rest of the brain to maintain that working memory. And in the lower layer, this is where you give the signal to motor cortex. So you either move or not move, or you don't give it to move, to not move, but you give it to move. So. We tested that hypothesis. Uh, we collected a localizer, and we had to make this surface rendering. And in this case, we were limited in our coverage, but we covered exactly over the uh, dorsal lateral pre prefrontal cortex. And we found this, uh, which was which was a surprisingly nice result. And that is that uh, during the working memory phase, there was more activation in the upper layers. Uh, with uh, uh, um, manipulation than with memory, but there are still some. And in the lower layers, it didn't really show as much at all for either. There wasn't any much much differentiation. Uh, looking at the lower layers, so this is looking at the upper layers, and this is looking at the lower, uh, at, I'm sorry, this is looking at the deeper layers here. This is upper layers, deeper layers. And this is um, during the response. So in the response phase, when the subject actually pressed a button to respond, there was nothing. But when they, uh, and mind you, this is this is actually dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. This isn't motor cortex. And when they decided to press the button to respond, uh, when they did respond, the lower layer was activated uh, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So, so as expected, uh, you can see this, or as sort of hypothesized, you see this clear differentiation between upper and lower layers. It actually turns out because the cortex here is, is kind of thick, uh, you see a pretty good differentiation in bold as, as well. Both bold contrast and vaso show this, this differentiation between upper layer activity with the, with, uh, with the working memory and lower layer uh, with the response. So, so that's just the beginning. Obviously, we'd like to see simultaneously the rest of the brain and uh, to see, you know, what's what's what else is being at, what other layers are being activated. So, uh, so once again, superficial layers are preferentially active during the delay phase, um, and deeper layers are preferentially active during the response phase. Only during the actual response. All right. So, looking at resting state connectivity for mapping feed forward and feedback connections. So this this is starting to get at uh, understanding hierarchy. Uh, of the brain. You know, what's feed forward, what's feedback? So Renzo started out by picking just a, the first part of this experiment is picking three regions of interest uh, uh, in the lateral genica nucleus, B1, uh, and this is just showing how we localize them, and also MT, which is functionally localized by motion stimulus right here. And what we decided to do was uh, we, we decided to specifically only look at the V1 layer profile. So we looked, got V1 and looked at the layer profile. And this is all resting state as well. And so taking a resting state seed from LGN, we calculated the 
the, the correlation across the layers, across the whole layer um, in V1. And we found that uh, as, as we expect, the LGN feeds into layer four of V1. And we found the highest correlation in the middle layer of V1 with LGN. If we shifted the seed to MT, as we expect that happens with MT, uh, this, you know, it's a good thing we know a lot more about the visual cortex uh, you know, from other studies that we can actually help constrain these studies. Uh, we know that MT feeds into layer, <clears throat> uh, the, the lower layers and the upper layers for the feedback. So MT is a little bit higher in the hierarchy. It feeds back into, into V1 uh, uh, in layer two and uh, three and also four, uh, five and six. And what we see here is that as expected, the correlation coefficient of that seed um, with with V1 shows this different profile. So we're so we're still looking at the same profile, but we're just seeing how it correlates with different areas that we that we pull out different correlation coefficients. To, and we can derive then that V1 is receiving is 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 receiving feed forward uh, feedback from MT, and it's also receiving feed forward from LGN. Okay. Uh, did I have that opposite? It receives feedback. Oh, I got it right. Feedback from MT and then feed forward from LGN. So we decided to take this further. <clears throat> and, and this is actually one way that we thought of, of, of probing uh, wider swaths of, of resting state data. And that is, let's use these templates. Let's actually use these templates and say, okay, so we know that this represents uh, a layer profile of feed forward of a feed forward dominated column, and this represents feedback. So we picked a, we first had a seed in, LG, uh, in, in the thalamus. <coughs> this is looking at resting state. And we calculated the layer profile across every single column along the entire visual cortex here. And we found that they all predominantly matched this profile right here. So that suggests that all the, uh, the rest of V1 is receiving input from LGN. And, but if we move that seed along V1 and then in the V2 and, and so on, we find that the areas below that now look like this. So they're receiving feedback and all the areas above it still look like this. They're receiving feed forward information. And if we keep on moving along, moving along, it, it, that whole area just shifts uh, in terms of what receives this versus this. And finally, if we get just below MT, uh, still MT is is receiving the feed forward input, and every everywhere else, the the, the sensory stimulus uh, or the the connectivity profile looks this way. So once again, these are the same voxels we're looking at. It's just that the correlation with that seed changes in the profile. So, so it might be a nice way of probing relative to a seed. Uh, but we we actually decided to take this a little bit further and thought, oh, I'm sorry, this is just a, a movie uh, just showing moving through uh, the same data. All right, we tried to take this further and we thought, okay, how do we get around the idea that we need a seed? Um, and it turns out that that we get around that idea be, by, um, you know, the, a common analysis in fMRI is looking for hub uh, hub um, Nodes or hub voxels, basically, the areas that are that are have the highest correlation with the rest of the brain are considered hubs. So we we thought of let's instead of doing that in the whole brain scale, let's do that with each column. So let's calculate it across each column all the time series and find out what what the hub voxels in the column was were. So the idea then would be that the areas that are the hubs that have the highest correlation uh, uh, with the rest of the columns with the rest of the voxels in the column are sort of the areas where the most activity is. And so we can you know, collect all these time courses, find out what has the most highest correlation. And this is a, a measure of hubness. So you can actually say, okay, well, this particular column, the superficial shows the highest correlation with everything else. And there's another hump here in the lower one. So that seems to suggest that there's the most stuff going on in terms of upper layers and lower layers uh, overall. This is not relative to a seed. And it turns out when we do that, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity that's sort of not random uh, throughout the brain. Uh, the hubness of each column is, uh, of the resting state signal in each column is very different depending on where you are. 
And one preliminary, and this is very preliminary, uh, we wrote that up in a uh, most recent paper by Renzo, but it's still preliminary, is that there, it seems like there's this beautiful division between frontal areas that show uh, sort of a suggestion of a middle area, um, uh, uh, middle of the uh, column and versus, uh, or maybe a bimodal sort of effect versus the whole parietal area, which just shows predominantly uh, sort of a middle uh, sort of hub right here. Uh, so that suggests that these are dominated by feed forward columns and these are dominated by feedback columns. So, like I said, we don't know exactly how to interpret this further, but we're just struck by the by the clear anatomic difference uh, that, that shows up. Okay, naturalistic movie, movie viewing. All right, I have a little bit more time left. I, maybe I'll have 10 more minutes at the most. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is what Renzo did. Uh, he thought, okay, well, you know, we, let's make use of this human connectome data, even though it was collected at low resolution. This is uh, 1.6 millimeters, relatively low. Um, let's do something with that at high resolution. So we, he collected uh, a bunch more data with six more participants at at super high resolution and uh, uh, using the same exact movie sequence that was collected with the connectome data. And what he did was take the signal from the default mode network of those of those connectome subjects, 93 participants, and average it up and making an average time series from a naturalistic movie. And essentially then what he did was just simply use that as a regressor against his high resolution data that he collected to then do layer analysis of, of that signal from that data. And he found some interesting results that uh, looking at, for instance, the posterior cingulate, he found uh, what suggests that this is the driving hub uh, feed forward sort of activity that occurs in the middle layer of posterior cingulate, but at very different uh, prof layer profiles uh, in inferior parietal cortex uh, and, and medial prefrontal cortex, inferior parietal, medial prefrontal, that show uh, either this, this bimodal re uh, hub, pro uh, bimodal uh, column profile, uh, uh, layer profile and also an upper uh, uh, profile as well. So suggesting that these areas are communicating each other in in different ways in the default mode network. Of course, you could look at the whole brain, which still he's yet doing. Um, and then taking this one step further, one thing that they found in the connectome study is that the subjects pooled into three groups that responded to the movies differently. And they couldn't really make much of a difference. They found that, uh, you know, there are certain frames, like looking at oceans, there wasn't much different, but looking at, you know, kissing scenes or whatever, uh, there was more difference in the time series. But then taking it one step further to the layer responses, he, uh, what Renzo found was that this biggest difference was only apparent in the upper layers, the input layers, uh, 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 seemingly uh, in, in these regions right here. So, so that seems to suggest that there's a layer specificity of the difference that might stratify things more. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a new student, Tyler Morgan, who has been developing an, at Glasgow line scanning. So that's going the opposite direction, away from whole brain imaging, more towards just focusing in the line scanning. And the advantage of that is that one, uh, since you're no longer taking up all this time spatially encoding the data, you just saturate it out and then collect it, you can actually do a lot more with what your signal is. So he collected multi-echo uh, uh, line scanning at an extremely high temporal resolution as well. So he's able to do T2 star mapping in which based on the T2 star and S0 that you get from this data, you can easily differentiate the different layers at very high resolution. Um, so he's able to do that more accurately. And, and then of course, he's able to do studies with at higher temporal resolution as well. And his particular study here that I'm not going to delve into since I'm running out of time, but basically showing that receptive field size and orientation tuning strength 
show preferential selectivity to the infragranular and supergranular layers. So, uh, and receptive field size is more preferential to supergranular layers. So this is really interesting. I mean, you give up a lot, but you also gain uh, a little bit more specificity and accuracy in, in, in for specific studies. Um, I'm not going to go into vapor, but uh, uh, there's a paper written on it uh, by Yahui Chai. Uh, we're actually starting to explore uh, uh, motion and, and sort of how visual and auditory motion stimuli combine. So you, you imagine that would combine somewhere. It turns out that, uh, so we have a ball moving left to right. We have visual motion as well. And then we have the audio motion that corresponds to that, that we either put in or not. And we select an area in the auditory cortex and very quickly uh, get pretty clear results of, of, for instance, sound versus silence. You have large swaths of the plate of temporality activated. Uh, moving versus stationary, you get slightly different areas. And it turns out that if you divide this color code, the plane of temporality, and this is the color code right here, you have some areas that show um, with audio only, you show selective activation right here. Uh, uh, visual only, surprisingly, you get with visual activation, you get one area, but no, almost no activation uh, out here. Um, but if you combine audio and visual, you get a, suddenly a lot of activation. And so then what he decided to do, and I'll just show one slab of this data, he took this area, this column, and looked at the layer profile with his vaso and found that that it turns out that uh, using vapor, uh, this is a combined perfusion and, and blood volume contrast, that the middle layers were more selectively activated, uh, uh, suggesting input uh, being uh, for the um, for audio visual, the combined audio visual, no activation for just visual and uh, large amounts of activation for audio, but then combined uh, audio visual showed selective mid layer activation. Okay, last part. Um, uh, so right now we're limited to, you know, we have been for the most part and still are for the most part limited to, you know, either taking small segments or lines or small slabs with this, with vaso at least. And, uh, you know, we'd like more. Um, and we can. It turns out that, uh, that Renzo made the insight uh, that what we really are looking at with vaso, we don't need to know, we actually don't need to know the blood. That's great if we do, but all we really need is a T1 difference between blood and tissue, which you can get anywhere, which you can get with any waiting time. So you can, you can compress that and do that very quickly. You give up a little bit of sensitivity, but, uh, but you can actually do it very rapidly. So you can actually then go about whole brain imaging uh, with vasocontrast. Uh, 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 for doing uh, functional MRI. So this is, uh, you know, quality of the images. Um, uh, the signal to noise is, you know, just barely above that, that magic number. Uh, and this is like a whole brain uh, um, uh, 0.8 millimeter isotropic 104 slices of layer fMRI. So comes out pretty dramatically. And you can start to get <laughs> the stripe pattern everywhere. Uh, all, no matter where you look, you see this characteristic stripe pattern. And so it turns out that you can do a lot of things with this. And you can either go to whole brain, or you can give some of that up for fasting uh, shorter TR, and you can derive information there. So in this case, he did high temporal resolution and found that the blood volume returned the baseline as, as was shown in other literature, is slower than the return to baseline with, with, with bold. Um, it, there's a perseveration of higher blood volume. So it's slightly slower. Uh, or you can go to ultra high resolution, give up your time resolution again, go to 0.5 millimeter isotropic uh, in this case. So you can do a lot of things with this compressing uh, your prep period. And as I mentioned, that's that's the, the high high space temporal resolution. But here's the conundrum. So uh, so typically with vaso, with whole brain EPI, you, uh, you, know, you can actually divide the brain into segments or into um, parcels. 
take all these parcels and look at the connectivity profile. But now you have this whole other dimension uh, in which each area you can then divide into another uh, connectivity profile between the layers within each region. And suddenly you have this explosion of another dimension of, of information. And this is just us just barely scratching the surface of that information. You have connectivity profiles in the visual network, sentry network, default mode network, and so on, where there's tons of rich detail in all of this layer profiles uh, uh, between these regions. These are Each one of these is a layer profile uh, for V5, V1, and so on. So, so that's an explosion of data uh, uh, that we're still trying to develop pipelines for looking at efficiently and accurately. And, uh, you know, you can actually um, look at ICA components that correspond to all kinds of higher areas. Uh, this is a, a nice review article by Emily Finn that summarizes that. And when you look at these high, higher cortical area profiles uh, with, with resting states, you see a whole slew of different sort of uh, layer, layer profiles. Everything from this this bimodal one to higher activation in, in uh, uh, upper layers versus lower layers and so on. So there's a lot of information here uh, that's just kind of waiting to be decoded in some regard. All right, so that pretty much is my talk, but uh, I just want to end with some challenges for the future. Uh, one, we're, we're actively working on processing pipelines for making sense of this added dimension in an efficient way. Uh, we'd really like to understand uh, laminar organization across the brain. We sort of understand it in sensory cortex and motor visual. Uh, prefrontal cortex is kind of a mystery. Um, there's all these other areas that it's not always clear exactly what layer does what. Um, so that needs to be better understood by other modalities. Cross subject comparisons. How do you, so right now, everything I've showed you was individual subjects. Uh, it would be nice to find better, more clever ways of comparing across subjects. Uh, it's almost impossible to register uh, data at this resolution. Um, you know, Emily's been playing with the idea of even doing cross subject correlation, you know, along the lines of, uh, 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 of Yuri Hassan, sort of taking a, a movie and seeing how the subjects correlated across subjects. So how do you do that if you have this ultra high resolution? Uh, and also, of course, uh, a lot of the field will be pushed ahead by, by clever paradigms that derive more insight into what's going on and how to modulate these layer activities. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank Renzo Humer, Emily Finn, Yahui Chai, and also Lin Ching Lee, who helped out you, Hui Chai, and his pulse sequence, which was uh, for Vapor, and then Tyler Morgan, who just joined our group. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. That was really, really nice, uh, and a, a lot of information. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to see if folks had, I guess, any questions. Armin, did you have? Did you want to? Um, Take a look at the chat and see if, if people want to put their questions into chat uh, for Peter, or if you would like to uh, let us know, we can try to let folks ask questions. So right now, I don't see any specific question uh, on the chat. Great. Okay. We are open to questions right now, if anyone yeah. has questions. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I guess while we're letting people think a little bit, um, I had a couple questions. Um, one was, um, I guess I was curious about the, the movie uh, correlation where, the, where um, you took the human connectome data and, and, and averaged and then, then went back to the high resolution, the 7T data. Um, why do it that way versus doing the averaging within the six subjects? I guess I'm, I'm wondering because the, yeah. the connectome data is bold, and so that would be a little bit weighted towards probably the larger vessels, et cetera. So just curious about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, uh, oops, looks like somebody's requesting to annotate, but oh well. Um, uh, looks like, I think that, uh, I and, and actually that's something I talked to Renzo briefly about. I think it was just a matter of signal to noise and having a... Okay. Uh, but you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, you could just do it with. We were trying to figure out a way of, of 
tapping into that large set of data in some way. Right. And right using right. this super high fidelity signal uh, time series would is one way. But I agree, there might be some differences between the bold and the Vaser time series itself. So yeah, yeah. Um, and then I'll ask one more, and then we'll we'll let others uh, uh, pipe in. But um, what you're doing here is really interesting because you're actually getting at multi scales, multiple spatial scales, and um, you're you're kind of doing it in this sort of iterative way where you sort of look at this larger space and then you zoom in and you look at the smaller space. Um, and there are a lot of techniques that can try to unify that and sort of give you a, a big, sort of almost like a hierarchical perspective. Um, and uh, even things like, um, you know, some work Armin was doing looking at like a thousand component ICA, you know, on the brain and things like that. So, so um, I think there's a lot here and um, <clears throat> I just sort of a comment, I guess. And then the other um, thing was that there's this whole temporal dimension, which, which also has multiple scales, which I think you've you kind of touched on a little bit, but you haven't really, you know, you've already got tons of data here, but that gives you a whole nother data explosion. It's really rich, I think, uh, getting at dynamics and spatial and temporal and all those pieces. And so I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or, you know, other than, yes, we've got lots of work to do, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, actually, I think that, uh, right, we haven't even touched on the temporal uh, dimension, like looking at dynamic connectivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense, the, the 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 modulation tasks are kind of getting at modulation of, of the effect. But, but you'd like to look at, you know, resting state and, and how, you know, if you do get a decrease in default mode network, what does that what does that mean in terms of the layer activity everywhere else or whatever? So, um, I think right now we're just limited. We're just signal to noise limited. Uh, it's it's hard to have a sliding window or do whatever uh, to pull that out yet. Um, so if we can actually maybe use some sort of vaso generated mask and just look at where it doesn't really matter as much that you have. I didn't even emphasize that with bold. You always have this this weighting of peel vessels. But if you if you mask based on vaso and if you mask the bold and you look at and you just care about changes over time, then it doesn't really matter. You don't really need to have a proper scaling within the within the layer. You can actually look at the time course pretty nicely. So you could use bold. I think bold might be better for for collecting that dynamic information once you know where you're looking exactly. Right, right. Yeah. Um, there, there's a question from Katero Asai that, that basically gets at individual variability. So diversity and activation within individuals could be caused by individual experiences of each individual. Um, and so how, how much have you looked at the variability across subjects? I guess that's another whole <laughs> dimension. Yeah. Obviously. Um, well, we did, we, you know, for all these studies, uh, especially Renzo's early ones and Emily's, uh, we collected multiple individuals. And for the most part, uh, we just looked at how they were similar. And we were, we right. were happy to see that they were similar <laughs> step at one step at a time, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but I'm sure there's differences. Uh, yeah. And and it's a matter of just looking at that next. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Xing, so very exciting talk. So following up, uh, following the same question as Vince uh, asks. So for this uh, layer specific uh, fMRI. Uh, so what's the you know the special challenge uh, for you know data analysis? So I saw one slide. You show the directional, you know, connectivity. So that's quite interesting. So we do a uh, uh, casual, you know, analysis simply uh, based on the uh, functional connectivity uh, network. So uh, what's your uh, point on, you know, specific, uh, you know, challenges uh, caused by, you know, this uh, layer specific uh, FMI, uh, well, you know, data? Well, I think if I understood your question right, um, uh, you know, the way we are, the, the, I guess my point is, is that, yes, there's been a lot of work on looking at directional connectivity, you know, either by things like Granger causality or, or other sort of mathematical approaches on the time series. And they're always wrought with problems of, of interpreting hemodynamic latencies and things like that. And um, not saying they're, they're all wrong, but they're, they're hard. And here, if you know, I guess my point is, is that if you know uh, that you have selective activation of the middle layer, you know that it's receiving input. You know the direction based simply on where it is in what layer it's on. 
And if it has upper or lower layers, you know it's it's maybe sending out information. I mean, there's different ways of interpreting that even though, but at least you know uh, based on the literature of of what these what these layers do. And if you know where the activation is, you know that it's that it's receiving or sending out information. So, so in it's other words, directional. Uh, this. So in other words, uh, do you think uh, you know this layer uh, specific FMI can facilitate? You know the grandeur, you know, causality analysis or other, you know, causality uh, modeling, because it will give uh, some, you know, uh, intuitive uh, information on the directionality in the connectivity network. So I'm I'm sorry, I didn't quite capture your question. So uh, oh, in other words, uh, this uh, you know layer specific FMI and facilitate, you know, the current you know causality uh, modeling. Which is, uh, you know, very much, you know, data driven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think actually, it would be interesting to see how they compare. I mean, I, I, there's been no studies on uh, uh, comparing one against the other. Um, yeah, I'm, I've always been a little bit uh, skeptical uh, of drawing causality just from the time series, uh, just because there's there's a lot of other stuff in there that could affect things. But it can be done, I believe, and it would be really cool to see that that. This I don't even know if layer FMRI is a gold standard necessarily, but maybe there's a certain specific platform that you can uh, know that and then compare with things like Ranger causality. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I have a related question there. So when you're doing resting state connectivity, like doing correlations, uh, potentially even that could be uh, modulated or potentially contaminated by HRF differences across layers. Um, right? Yeah, uh, well, yes and no. Um, that is true in theory, but, you know, our TR is like six seconds. And so, you know, you, you have differences and, and um, it, 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 maybe you're, if you're worried about latencies, if you have a TR of six seconds, and right now we're not doing like event related, we're doing like block design uh, for our tasks. And for resting state, uh, yeah. It might have some differences, but I, I, my sense is that with that long of a TR and the fact that the hemodynamic response is pretty slow, you would have to have massive differences to, to really cause it to change the results, I think. So that's just my guess. Right. Um, so uh, Jordan uh, Thoreau had a, uh, a question about um, the relationship between vaso uh, and glucose consumption. I guess, let me read the whole thing. Um, uh, but bold vaso, the, he wants to know about the relationship between bold vaso and, and metabolic processes underlying the signal. Um, Bednarik uh, used 7T to show bold correlated with local changes in lactate concentration and by extension aerobic uh, glycolysis. Do you know if vaso has the same relationship to glucose consumption as bold? There you go. Huh. Mm -hmm. um... Well, I know that uh, you know we've done studies of of vaso versus bold in terms of you know okay so I don't think that there's any difference between vaso and bold in terms of it's a hemodynamic response and and vaso happens to be a little bit more localized to where it's actually happening uh, and and they all have some proportionality to these metabolic processes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so so I don't think we can say much more beyond that uh, it it seems like there's nothing special. I mean, Vaso is just looking at the blood volume change, and that happens to be a little bit more specific. But bold, you know, also goes up in proportion to metabolic activity and, and things like that as well. So they're all they all show this. We actually never. I mean, and also people actually have, I believe, a little bit have done where they looked at, you know, a graded uh, stimulus where they, you know, they increase the rate or something. And blood volume changes also follow that uh, pretty closely. So. I'm not concerned that we're either missing something with bold or missing something with vaso. Um, certainly, that relationship needs to be tightened up. But in terms of interpreting just simply where something happens, uh, I don't think it's 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 somehow like a critical. I mean, it's important to know that there's a relationship, and uh, it doesn't doesn't fundamentally change what what the what you can conclude at least at the broad level here. Right. Um, exactly. 
By the way, I've got, uh, have you considered using the term uh, finger monculus? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Peter, go, go for it. So. <laughs> um, yeah. so do we have any other questions for Peter? May, may I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. How you come up with a good prediction-based study for layer-based fMRI? Because you have, uh, first of all, ex excellent talk. Thank you very much. I didn't mention. Uh, and you showed a lot of results which are ex sort of exploratory. So we don't have ground truth for this. And we should uh, you know there are people who would say probably it's motion, probably it's uh, some. So uh, ground truth is uh, monkey traces, trace studies. But on one hand, it's monkeys, and on one other hand, for for high high level associative areas, we don't have many trace studies, so we don't. So, what is your take on it? How, how would you suggest? It? Yeah, no, I think I think you you nail it on the head. We we don't have many good gold standard studies of knowing that, in fact, what's going on in those layers are is exactly right. I mean, we can only and and so right in our in our paradigm design. We're doing our best to try to sort of modulate prediction the best we know how. And then and it seems that more often than not, it, it seems like the studies are confirming what we expect, at least what we generally know about layers in auditory or sensory cortex. Um, and, and as far as prefrontal, that was that was sort of speculative, but it seemed to to fit. Once again, it's not, there's no, you know, what we need is either monkey studies or other other primates or other animal studies have actually, you know, it's going to be hard to actually confirm. I mean, you might be able to converge on some sort of principle of how the layers are organized in prefrontal cortex. So you don't have to measure everywhere. <laughs> so, but we haven't done, there haven't been a lot of studies in the literature to really make that map of what, what uh, layers are doing everywhere. <laughs> so to that degree, we need to actually have sort of converging paradigms that maybe get some sort of answer, triangulate some sort of answer and, and arrive at it that way. Uh, yeah, right, we're okay. at this very early stage now. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sure. So uh, we have two questions in the chat. Uh, one question is, uh, uh, how many boxes are, collect, collect, are collected uh, in high resolution fMRI and what was the TR? Yeah, and, well, it, yeah, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, how many voxels? I mean, the the voxel. So the the field of view is like twenty millimeters, and the and uh, the voxel dimensions are you know, point seven to point eight, and and uh, uh, and the slice. We tried to make uh, uh, the voxel somewhat isotropic, so the slice thickness is that. So you can kind of do the. It's a lot of voxels. <laughs> like four hundred cubed or something like that. Yeah, right. give or take. Yeah. Right, and then. Uh, uh, what was the other question? The, the, the TR. TR. Um, yeah, the TR varies. Um, uh, in the the first pulse sequence, the the overall TR was about like six seconds because you had to sort of have a control. And then, um, uh, but right now for whole brain, we can get down to to a TR of about uh, um, I think if I oops if I back up a little bit, um, uh, you know, you can get down to right here, I mean, depending on how you look, you can get down to uh, a TR of, of eight seconds with the whole brain. Uh, this is whole brain, um, or or down to a TR of uh, 0.65 seconds if you're if you're just collecting, you know, a few slices, eight slices. So, it, yeah, mm. so this is the, the, the non-standard sequence, but it works pretty well. Mm. And there's another very interesting question. Uh, how do you account for HRF differences between layers? Yeah, well, that was the previous question. Um, uh, we don't. Uh, we don't. We just, uh, there's no evidence. Uh, I mean, you know, right. Certainly, the HRF is varies. We don't know if that's systematic or that's just noise. Um, certainly, the best way we account for it, and this is important, um, with bold, for instance, we see clear differences in HRF. It typically is due to the fact that you've captured a big vessel. If you capture a big vein with bold, it will show a latency that's longer and it will be maybe wider by maybe up to a couple seconds. Um, but because we're looking at this uh, micro vessel effect, uh, 
we have so far no evidence at all that the microvessels have you know any systematic shift in in latencies. They're all pretty well behaved, I believe. I mean, from any hemodynamic model, if you have you, the smaller the vessels you look at, the closer it is to neural activity, and the more ho homogeneous uh, the timing is. So I, I don't think that there's a hemodynamic uh, source of a, of a shift in he hemodynamic responses. Uh, across layers, because we're looking at microvessels. We're selectively with vaso looking at microvessels. Uh, but if you're looking at bold, yes, there will be a systematic latency. Upper layers will show longer delays because they're peel vessels uh, by a few seconds, by maybe a second or something. So. Uh, I have a question. This is a really nice talk, very convincing. Um, so the question is that uh, I was very inspired by the fact that when you move the seed voxel um, in the visual cortex and you look at the correlation from the seed to back to V1 to see how the uh, laminar profile of the functional connectivity would change based on the seed location, I think this is very informative. Now, the, from the monkey anatomical studies, we know there's a concept of hierarchical distance. So there's a free four projection from V1 is most dense to V2 and get a little bit weaker to V3 and then further on. So further separated in hierarchy, um, the connectivity is getting weaker and weaker. So we should be probably expecting seeing something uh, more of a graded variation of that lambda profile. I, will, I thought that would be a really nice way to test the sensitivity of the lambda specific connectivity. Have you actually found it or maybe yeah, uh, that's talk about it? Yeah, no, that's a really good. That's a really good question. That's a really good point, and and that's a a, a really nice follow up. The study I showed was was sort of a binary, um, sort of like whether it correlated more with one profile versus the other. So we were just classifying, uh, but the information is there, and it certainly would be interesting to see if the uh, fidelity or the the you know the correlation sort of drifted off with with uh, with with distance in terms of the hierarchies. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, Makesh was asking about the initial dip. Can you see the initial dip at 7T in VASO, and does, can you use that to further improve spatial resolution? Yeah. Um, well, we can't see the initial dip because uh, in most of our studies, we're not sampling fast enough. Uh, <laughs> we, haven't, we, we haven't jittered uh, our response relative to the stimulus to actually look for the initial dip, but um, you know, usually the initial dip happens Two seconds later, and it and it lasts a half a second, and it's tiny. And <laughs> and even with bold, if you're looking really hard, you can't see the initial dip. Uh, it's kind of random why we see it or we don't. The post undershoot is easier to see, but the initial dip is is even elusive in super high sensitivity bold responses. And I, you know, I've looked for it a lot, and we certainly you, can't. You see believe it. in the initial dip? Uh, the dip wars, right? <laughs> Hear evidence from my own work that that uh, it's a consistent <laughs> enough. Of <laughs> Maybe we'll see. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but micro vessels anyway. So um, you know we're using, and also we're just at the edge of what signal noise we have. So we're using everything we can just with the major, the main signal response. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ying Guo is asking about negative functional connectivity. So. Um, much of negative FC is often attributed to artifacts. Do you think negative FC provides important insights? Um, does this technique um, uh, provide new information about negative functional connectivity? Yeah. I guess, I guess um, it's referring to anti-correlations, I guess, or some. some uh, right. If we're looking at correlations, um, uh, I believe that, uh, yeah, certainly negative connectivity of, you know, you turn on one network, you turn off the other. And and um, uh, I believe we we haven't seen it that much, but um, but I, I have no doubt that it's there and it would be interesting to explore. I mean, uh, at least in these, this level of study, yeah. For the connectivity you're using, are you doing any sort of like the global uh, signal normalization or um, 
There's also uh, full correlation and partial correlation, things like that. So yeah, so so it's a really important point that in this particular case, so because we're in that regime where where thermal noise dominates, uh, there's no there's no physiologic noise. I mean, it's all sounded <laughs> so so we don't have to do any you know any sort of physiologic noise correction in any sort of way because it's all thermal noise dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't do that. Okay. Okay. So you're so you know I think the argument would be if you had done it you can artificially induce um, I guess Ying's going to jump in there and ask her own uh, follow up go ahead Ying <laughs> yeah thank you Vince uh, thank you Peter uh, just a reason I'm asking this is that um, negative functional connectivity is, is often kind of brushed under the rug in the, in the connectivity analysis because the difficulty to understand it and interpret it and um, but sometimes uh, what we have observed is that when we looking at the connectivity matrix across the brain, especially, we see a, a large number, a large proportion of the cross, you know, module, especially connectivity are negative. And another thing is that we found that when you're looking at a regular, the traditional, you know, TR functional connectivity matrix versus the high resolution, high resolution, the human connectome connectivity matrix. One thing we found interesting is that the amount of negative connectivity on the off diagonal of the connectivity matrix seems to change. The amount and the magnitude has changed. So that's why I'm wondering whether the higher frequency FMI can provide some actually a new information on how to understand and, you know, and interpret the negative FC. Yeah. You mean the higher spatial frequency? Um... Uh, yeah, no, I think actually, uh, so right now, um, yeah, I don't think that, uh, so yeah, well, we're definitely not, um, we're not, we're not ignoring it. Uh, and, and we're actually just beginning right now. We're just looking at sort of positive templates, but you can imagine, you know, if you, if you like, for instance, made a, a, a library of templates of, of, of connectivity profiles across layers, uh, I, I have, you know, what we should build into it is is negative templates as well, where ones that show below baseline. Um, and right. and I think I, I agree with you. I think that there's there's information to be had in terms of what areas are being turned off uh, uh, correspondingly, and even what layers are being turned off or or not um, or suppressed. I mean, we did see. I mean, the one example, the only one example, is in the first motor response uh, study by Renzo when he showed ipsilateral finger tapping. There was a clear suppression in the upper layer uh, of, of the ipsilateral motor cortex. Uh, so that was a clear suppression. And there's no reason to doubt that that doesn't exist in resting state as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we've run out of questions and I think we've kept you for a while. So um, it's been really great having you join us and uh it was a great talk and, and so much information and just to remind everyone we do um have this recorded and we release this um uh you know all the brain space initiative talks are, are available and we'll also have follow-up uh discussions in in the slack uh channels as well um if you anyone wants to follow up with discussions about 7t and you know high resolution and um other kinds of questions um yeah. so yeah, I'm happy to answer questions as well, whatever. So Great, great. Thank you. Um, Armin, did you have any other um, uh, points to make before we sign off? Or? Yes, and, and I want to also point out Renzo would be available on Slack if anyone has a specific question about the study. So we will be happy to answer your question as well. Just want to point out. Excellent. All right. Well, um, thanks, everybody, for joining us on a Friday. And uh, have a great rest of your day. And, and try to pretend that there's something different about the weekend. <laughs> and enjoy it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks bye again. Bye. Thanks Goodbye. so much. Okay. All right.